Welcome back. We're looking at D-Day and Beyond. It's a game from Tiny Battle Publishing, uh, a Mark Walker company. It's one of the few boxed companies or boxed games that uh, comes from Tiny Battles. They tend to do folio scale games. And the uh, quality has been uh, given the requisite boost uh, with the nice full color map that comes in two sections and I'll, I'll show you the map in a minute. Really what I wanted to do is focus in on sort of breaking down one of the cool things about this game. Uh, not the only cool thing about the game, but uh, one of the cool things about the game is the how combat can work in certain circumstances and where it makes the most sense to you as, uh, as the player. So this hex here had these two units in it and they were both flipped uh, to their full strength sides, like so. So this guy's a six, 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 six attack, six defend, six move. And this stack and part of this stack attacked this stack. Ah, and I don't have my tweezers. This could get ugly. All right. Uh, but one of the things you can do here in multi-hex attacks and, and multi-unit attacks is you can allocate units to attack a, sp a specific unit as long as every unit in the stack is attacked. So this leads uh, to some interesting uh, min-maxing, what-ifing. It can also generate some slightly different results than your typical uh, the attacker loses one, defender loses one and retreats type of thing. There's a table over here, which a little bit of an eye chart. I'm not super, you know, like from a graphical standpoint, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's a particularly attractive uh, chart given the choice of colors and backgrounds on the fonts and things, but we'll look at that in a sec too. Uh, so, he, so here's what you can do. So I can take all of these factors here, so 12 and 5, 17, and then I added in... Uh, these guys as well, uh, another seven. And we attacked this unit here to get a higher odds attack. And then I did a soak off attack when this guy was a four, I believe. Yeah, he's a four here. And I used this dude, the four and the three for seven to do a one to two attack uh, across the river and it was gonna drop back down to, sorry, a one-to-one -one attack. I was gonna drop down to a one-to-three attack and then we used air on it. That bumps it up to a one-to-two. It was attacker take a loss and uh, I think I rolled a 10 on that guy and defender, no, I must have rolled a 12 because I got an A1, D1 and it's actually an R. So this guy would retreat. I should have written down what happened, but nevertheless, I didn't. And then these guys did their attack here and then they, they got their results, which left this unit in the hex, but with just with a step loss. Uh, these divisions actually, <clears throat> or some of the divisions, uh, often have four, uh, four steps. So you'll, you'll flip once here, then get a, a brigade scale uh, unit, and then he'll, he, he has a chance to lose a step, so there's four steps. Uh, not so for uh, most of the allied units, they don't have those breakdowns. Uh, although the Brits do have some, actually, you know, there are some breakdowns for the allies, but not very many. So that's an interesting way to uh, sort of reconsider your attacks versus just taking the hammer approach and combining two hexes of factors and trying to beat up on a on a unit here, which is what we did. We, uh, we put a, a whole swag of combat factors against this hex and got him uh, reduced and pushed back one and now we did the same thing here i believe i had uh, these these two hexes sorry maybe this hex here attack into this hex here and then i had i had 18 factors attacking uh whatever was in the hex they ended up dying uh, even though it was in the woods uh, we rolled very, very well in turn five for that. And turn five is the second and eighth of July. So you can see, I think the uh, the allies are a little bit behind on their progress. This is the Orn uh, River here. Uh, 
we're struggling to keep stuff A, in supply, and B, uh, bringing enough units in. We took some heavy losses in the second and third turn. I actually lost two full British para divisions in a very Monty-esque effort to uh, uh, isolate the unit here and then attack it across, across the river, and that didn't go so well. Uh, 82nd and 101st, and whoever they are, the 13th, uh, are along the way. Those unit identifiers are kind of whack, aren't they? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> those those units there are all just, I'm going to sh either ship them back to the UK or just bring replacements in on turn nine and, and reboot those guys and bring them back up to full strength. You can use the paratroopers as much as you like in this particular game. So there's a number of different things that can go on here. There's uh, these, let me zoom out a little bit so we can see a few other things. So you've got these sectors that you can invade at, and then there's a table here to tell you what you can bring in each turn, uh, depending on the sector you're invading. Uh, sector five, and it goes all the way down to the south into the you know, Marseille area, uh, sector eight. Uh, it's a long game. The campaign game is 40, uh, 50, 50 turns. I'm playing just the shorter 13 turn scenario. Uh, here's your CRT that I was telling you. It's a, like I said, it's a little bit of an eyesore just with the, the whatever color this is, this khaki sort of color. Very, I will say, it pops out, right? Uh, would have been nice to have the 2D6 numbers on this right-hand side here as well, uh, just for, for quick reference versus having to go all the way across like that and look and keep track. But all that all works nice, uh, terrain effects chart and all that sort of good stuff. So really, uh, really enjoying the quick, simple, easy play at the moment. And I'm looking forward to uh, potentially redeeming myself uh, in terms of progress as we as we move along. Lots of other little interesting things with supply and wrecked ports and bits and pieces. Pretty simple, straightforward game. Uh, as you can see, there's not a lot of unit differentiation going on here. Uh, no special effects for combined arms or flanking maneuvers or any of that. Uh, you do have. Uh, interdiction that you can use these guys for. There's naval bombardment. <clears throat> There's a carpet bombing track. I can do carpet bombing every so often. Uh, unlimited sort of airdrops as well. So it's got uh, it's got a lot going for it, and there's a there's a lot in the game, in a pretty concise and well written set of rules. Uh, you know, I've got my little mulberries here. Supply is pretty important in the game. Uh, you've got to have enough support capacity and mulberry capacity to keep all the units that are not on a, excuse me, not on a beachhead. You've got to keep them, uh, you've got to keep track of those guys and the number of support factors or supply factors that you have will allow these guys to stay non-isolated so that they can function at full capacity. So interesting stuff. Uh, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna burn out a lot of brain cells playing it, but you are gonna, you know what it feels like to me? It kind of feels like uh, a, a grown-up, a little more sophisticated, a uh, little more uh, meaningful um, D -day, Avalon Hill D-Day. That's what it feels like to me. Uh, it's, it's fun, accessible, it's pretty pretty game. Obviously, D-Day at Avalon Hill was not a pretty game, but uh, this, uh, this has uh, enough going for it that uh, it's interesting and uh, entertaining. All right, talk to you soon.